We're very fortunate to start the day with two very distinguished thinkers. Um, I'll introduce them both. Uh, the first is uh, Professor Sharon Krause, who is Royce Family Professor of Teaching Excellence and Professor of Political Science here at Brown University. She's the author of Freedom Beyond Sovereignty, Chicago 2015, Civil Passions, Princeton 2008, and Liberalism with Honor, Harvard 2002 as well as uh, many articles and chapters on topics in classical and contemporary liberalism and democratic theory, as well as in the contemporary politics of justice, freedom, and social inequality. She's currently writing a book called Eco-Emancipation and Earthly Politics of Freedom, which examines the relationship between the human domination of nature and the political, economic, and social domination of human beings, and explores paths to more emancipatory forms of political life. Our second speaker will be uh, Branka Arsic, who is the Charles and Lin Zhang Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. She specializes in literatures of the 19th century Americas and their scientific, philosophical, and religious contexts. She's the author, most recently, of Bird Relics, Grief and Vitalism in Thoreau, Harvard 2016, which was awarded the MLA James Russell Lowell Prize for the Outstanding Book of 2017. She's also written On Leaving, a reading in Emerson, Harvard 2010, uh, a book on Melville entitled Passive Constitutions, or Seven and a Half Times Bartleby, Stanford 2007, and she's co-edited uh, essays on Emerson and on uh, Melville. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce them both. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm so looking forward to our conversation over the next two days. Um, so my paper on political respect for nature is part of the larger book project that Tamara just mentioned, uh, Eco-Emancipation. Um, and uh, political respect for nature is one part of the more emancipatory political relationships that the book envisions, both among people and between people and the earth. Um, so the political in political respect for nature is really crucial, and that's part of what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Ethical respect for nature is also important, but it's not enough. If respect for nature is limited to the domain of ethics, meaning something that we think about as being a personal obligation that we have as individuals, if respect for nature is limited to that, it essentially leaves non-human beings and things more or less dependent on the kindness of strangers in their interactions with us. And the kindness of strangers has never been a very reliable check on domination. So we need political respect for nature. Political respect for persons is a familiar feature of contemporary democracies. As a political principle, it justifies the structural limitation of political power through mechanisms like rights and political representation. Um, it also suggests that uh, political power is only legitimate when it serves the well-being of the people who are subject to it. As a political ethos, respect for, na for persons uh, orients citizens in their relations with one another. When it's working, it fosters both self-restraint and also responsiveness to the needs or well-being of others. Political respect for nature could do similar work. At the structural level, it can supplement respect for persons with institutional mechanisms that formally constrain what we can do to non-human beings and things, and that require us to use our power in ways that are responsive to their well-being along with our own. And as part of a shared political ethos among citizens, it could motivate more self-restraint and more responsiveness in our interpersonal interactions with Earth's non-human parts. So political respect for nature means acknowledging that non-human beings and things count, that they deserve to be treated according to standards of right, that there are principled constraints on how human power can be exercised over them. And it means establishing these constraints in the basic structure of society, in fundamental law, uh, and enforcing them with the coercive arm of the state, much as democratic societies establish and enforce respect for persons or are supposed to. 
So today I'm going to talk about um, the meaning and the experience and the practice of respect for uh, uh, of respect in in this form. And I'm drawing on two quite different sources. On the one hand, Kant's theory of respect for persons, uh, and on the other, Levinas's phenomenology of response to the other, which I get at by way of Derrida. But I'm pushing or I'm working with both of these ideas uh, fairly freely so that what I end up with is not anything that I think either Kant or Levinas would have recognized or accepted. Um, so I, I'm taking inspiration from them to kind of help fill out what political respect for nature could be in terms of its meaning and our experience of it. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sticking with them. And then uh, at the end, I'm going to talk very briefly about a couple of institutional mechanisms that could help us practice political respect for nature. Um, but before I go any further, I, I have two quick caveats. Um, the first is that uh, this, this paper focuses on the politics of respect for nature, or at least one aspect of the politics of respect for nature. Um, but the larger project, the book project, also argues for structural changes in the economy, uh, specifically for breaking the kind of stranglehold that uh, our current fundamentalist version of free market capitalism has on people and politics and the environment. But I'm not really going to talk about that. Reconstructing neoliberal economics isn't my focus today, though it is in the background of this paper, and it is something that's treated more directly in the book. The second caveat is about how I'm using the word nature, which I think I need to say something about since it's such a contested concept in the literature. I don't mean untouched wilderness. I agree with the people who have said that uh, concept is obsolete and, and was something of a fantasy to begin with. But the material world that we inhabit does contain lots of stuff that isn't us or isn't wholly us. Uh, so when I use the term nature and sometimes earth, I'm talking about the beings, beings, things, and assemblages that exceed the merely human, including both non-human animals uh, and what we commonly think of as the natural environment. OK, so first, what political respect means. We use the, respect, uh, the word respect in lots of different ways, um, including the special esteem that we feel for people we admire and the deference that's sometimes required for people who have authority over us, parents, teachers, employers, and so on. But when we're talking about respect as a political principle and a political ethos, it's a more impersonal phenomenon. It does have an affective valence, but it doesn't depend on our feelings for specific others, and it doesn't derive from the particularities of our personal relationships with them or from special attributes that are unique to them. To respect others in the political sense of democratic respect for persons is simply to acknowledge the normative force of their independent standing, their being for themselves, the irreducibility of their existence as exceeding its use value to us. Above all, respect for persons involves a habit of self-restraint. It means constraining the inclination to subject other people to the unbounded force of our own desires and perspectives. It also involves responsiveness to the needs or well-being of others. It makes life with other people freer and more rewarding over the long term. But it begins in the recognition of our limits. Now, one way to conceptualize this recognition is Kant's principle of respect for persons. So it holds famously that human beings are to be treated always also as ends in themselves and never merely as the means to the ends of others. In healthy democracies, this principle forms part of the basic structure or the structural framework of society. And it also gets internalized as part of the shared ethos, political ethos of citizens. Now, of course, Kant grounded his concept of respect for persons in the idea of rational autonomy. Uh, in his view, the rational capacity to formulate ends for themselves is what makes rational beings ends in themselves. And as such, rational beings are entitled to be protected from the unconstrained instrumentalizing power of others. In fact, given their independent, more than instrumental status, the exercise of unconstrained instrumentalizing power over them is always illegitimate, a violation of right. Respect for persons as a moral ideal Therefore, also has, however indirectly, it also has a political life. Specifically, it calls for Kant, what Kant referred to as republican political forms, including rights and political representation. 
Now, I don't mean to endorse the Kantian view wholesale. It misconceives human agency as I see it. It doesn't acknowledge the agentic capacities of many non-human animals. And in making rational autonomy the basis of moral standing, his approach excludes many people and all of what we typically think of as nature. So I want to be explicit about those limits or deficits as I see them. But still, his concept of, of respect is a powerful way to express the idea that the being of others exceeds their use value to us. And it connects this moral orientation to others to a political framework that establishes institutional protections against the instrumentalizing, unconstrained power of others. So I mean to detach these aspects of respect uh, from the other parts of Kant's philosophy and to reconstruct them uh, as a resource for a new kind of ecopolitics. From the post-Kantian ecological perspective that I have in view here, what entitles people and non-human beings and things to be respected as ends in themselves isn't rational autonomy, but the fact that their existence unfolds according to logics that aren't reducible to the purposes of others. Non-human beings and things are not for us in the sense of having been brought into existence for the sake of satisfying or serving human purposes nor is their well-being defined or necessarily advanced by serving us. Nature just is. It unfolds for itself. Like people, Earth's non-human parts are ends in themselves in the sense that they're not, in any fundamental sense, for anything else, including us. So it's important to see that respecting others always also as ends in themselves and never merely uh, as the means to our ends isn't the same thing as respecting them only as ends. The use of other uh, beings and things is a necessary condition of human existence, of all existence. To live on this earth is inevitably to use, to consume, to destroy. We can't not use nature. But we can exercise respect for nature while also making use of it to meet our needs if we acknowledge principal constraints on our use and if we attend to nature's well-being alongside our own. Understood this way, Respect is a way of relating to non-human beings and things that's more than merely instrumental, but that doesn't fetishize nature as an untouchable other, which is not to say that wilderness conservation has no place. I think it does. The point is just that the principle of respect doesn't have to imply a strictly hands-off attitude or stance toward the non-human world or thorough disengagement. Um, still, if nature isn't fundamentally for us, then the exercise of human power over non-human beings and things in ways that are unconstrained and merely instrumentalizing, that's going to count as illegitimate. That kind of use can only constitute a usurpation. But of course, that kind of use is the norm today. Nothing runs deeper in us, or at least in most of us, I think, in contemporary advanced democracies. Nothing runs deeper in us than the assumption that nature is for us. And consequently, political respect for nature requires a very deep, even existential, uh, shift in us. Jacques Derrida's meditation on the experience of being addressed by his cat captures the depth of this shift, what Derrida calls its abyssal rupture. So one morning while getting dressed, Derrida notices his little cat sitting in the corner of the room gazing at him. He realizes that the cat's watching him, and he sees her register the fact that he sees her watching. He becomes aware that he's being addressed by her, that he and the cat are interacting. So suddenly he realizes that he's naked, and he finds himself flooded with shame. Why? Surely his nudity means nothing to the cat. Um, no, it's that uh, the, the exchange has exploded, the conceptual framework, through which he's always looked at non-human animals. Like most of us, his orientation to animals has been an instrumentalizing one, a way of looking at non-human others that projects the human self, its needs, its purposes, its desires, onto them, subsuming the other under this projection of self and interpolating the animal as a mere thing available for human use. But as he says, the animal that sees me see it seeing me is not reducible to me, and it's not a mere thing. The radical alterity of the cat as being, in this sense, wholly other, stops Derrida in his tracks. It's a kind of an emperor has no clothes moment in which um, he sees that the very term animal, 
with its connotation of inferiority and brutishness, of thingness available for human use, that this term animal, as he puts it, is nothing more than a name that people have given themselves the right and the authority to give to the living other. But this authority is just a naked assertion of power, devoid of legitimacy, a usurpation. Derrida's shame about this usurpation turns out to be an ethically transformative epiphany. And in that sense, it calls to mind Emmanuel Levinas, whose phenomenology of facing the other inspired Derrida's meditation on his cat. Levinas himself paid little attention to the gaze of the animal. His account of ethical response to the call of another is limited to people. But it is, I think, generative for thinking beyond the human, too. For Levinas, ethical subjectivity is constituted in moments of epiphany like the one that Derrida describes, in which the subject suddenly finds himself called into question by the face of an other who addresses him. Levinas emphasizes the vulnerability of the other, which he associates with what he calls the defenseless eyes and the destitution and hunger of the poor, the stranger, the widow, the orphan. But it's not just the vulnerability of the other that stimulates the response. It's the irreducibility of their being that's made present to us by the face. The face of the other, Levinas says, disturbs the being at home with oneself of the subject, the I. And he describes this being at home with oneself as a form of egoism, what he calls a spontaneous freedom through which the subject projects himself onto the external world without limit, negating or possessing the non-me. This imperialism of the self is a naive, unself-conscious, and unconstrained exercise of power. Levinas refers to it as freedom, or a kind of freedom, but in reality, it locks the subject into a self-referential totality that's actually a kind of stultified containment, even captivity, which contrasts with what Levinas calls the infinity that's available when he welcomes an other who exceeds him and who brings me more than I contain. So the face of the other puts the spontaneous freedom of the subject or with the spontaneous freedom within us into question, it generates a critical attitude within that challenges the naive right of my powers to use, possess, and subsume all that is not me as if it were there for me. It gives rise to ethical subjectivity because morality begins when freedom, instead of being justified by itself, feels itself, he says, to be arbitrary and violent. This shame that freedom feels for itself is the shame that Derrida felt before his cat, whose gaze stripped him of his naive imperialism of self and species and made him acknowledge the emptiness of the presumed right by which people dominate animals. There are two aspects of this Levinasian response to the other that I want to highlight because um, they take us beyond the Kantian paradigm in a, in a way that um, I think helps fill out the experience of respect for nature. The first is the primordial quality of the response as grounded in the irreducible alterity of the other. And the second is its asymmetry. So the response is primordial in the sense that we're called, Levinas says, to respond not because of any essential attribute or particular quality in the other, not because of anything that makes the other like us. The response is about acknowledging the existence of others as having significance that cannot be captured by their significance for us. But it doesn't require us to specify the content of this remainder. In the context of respect for nature, this suggests that we can have different interpretations of nature's remainder, uh, or its moral remainder, and the basis of its more than merely instrumental standing. Some of us may see this remainder in religious terms, as in the idea that creation embodies divine meaning and purpose. Others may see it in aesthetic terms, focusing on the grandeur, sublimity that they find in nature. Still others may be agnostic about the remainder, simply accepting that Earth's being exceeds its being for us without needing to say why. In this sense, respect avoids a merely instrumental orientation to nature without insisting that nature has intrinsic value by virtue of some particular set of attributes. And it doesn't require us to assimilate nature's various parts to ourselves or make likeness a condition of respect. The asymmetry of the response is also important, though. Um, for Levinas, there's no assumption that um, the other will uh, or even could respond 
um, uh, or repay our response in kind. The epiphany attunes my ethical sensibility to the being of the other, but it focuses my practical action guiding faculties solely on myself. It tells me nothing about what the other should do. It gives me no grounds for expectations in that regard. And this is important in the context of respect for nature. Respect for nature is a way of relating to non-human beings and things. And in that sense, it's intersubjective. But it doesn't require perfect reciprocity. It doesn't ask non-human beings and things to respect us or one another in the same ways that we exercise respect. This asymmetry makes it a human-centered ideal, but not exactly an anthropocentric one. If respect for nature aims only to regulate the behavior of people, it doesn't treat the value of all things as being reducible to human use value, and it doesn't assimilate all things to a human standard, insisting on similarity with the human as a condition of moral and political standing. Now, you might wonder whether all non-human others have a face in the sense of being able to address us in uh, ways that inspire epiphany and response. After all, the, um, the, the, the communicative capacities that seem to be required to make an address, at least in the conventional sense, aren't shared by all things. Uh, a cat who can form conscious purposes and intentions and communicate them to us, you know, let's play, let me out the door, whatever. Uh, a cat um, addresses us in ways that a forest or a river can't exactly do. But on the other hand, forests and rivers are assemblages of countless non-human beings and things that affect and are affected by us, and their existence periodically erupts into our consciousness in all kinds of ways, as when a breeze carries the scent of pine uh, or the sound of birdsong from a nearby forest, or when the river behind us overspills its banks, flooding our homes and fields. Um, these eruptions differ from conscious, purposive address, but they do present the being to others, to us in ways that convey information about their condition and that can be transformative for us if we're receptive to them. They can function much like the address of a human or animal other, enlarging, as Levinas puts it, my own subjectivity by introducing into me what was not in me and putting into question the brutal spontaneity of my egoism as an imminent destiny. Along with people and animals then, non-human things like forests and rivers can be catalysts for ethical epiphany, for self-consciousness about our limits and shame about our usurpations. They can be catalysts for respect for nature. Still, if non-human beings and things can be catalysts um, for respect, in practice they often fail to generate the kinds of epiphany and response that Levinas depicts. Of course, the same is true of the people who address us. As a European Jew who lived through World War II, Levinas knew that the address of the other frequently fails to elicit a response, and he saw how destructive disavowal can be. But if he was alive to the limits of the face in this sense, he offers not much in the way of political resources for attenuating them. And we really need political resources here. Our current condition is one of overwhelming disavowal of non-human others. We're so steeped in the mentality of human exceptionalism and species superiority and the instrumentalization of nature that we've made ourselves blind and deaf to the address of non-human beings and things. To bring uh, respect for nature into being then, we need to insist on it as a political imperative and to actively cultivate it through our political institutions and collective practices. This means constituting robust political protections for nature uh, alongside our protections for people, and it means institutionalizing a responsiveness that orients us to nature in more than merely instrumental ways. So I'm gonna talk now briefly before I close about just two um, political mechanisms that currently help us uh, establish respect for persons that could also help us institutionalize respect for nature, and that's uh, representation and political, uh, sorry, representation and rights. So political representation in this context means including the well-being of nature in public decision making. Um, some environment, so this is a, an idea that environmental political theorists are developing. Um, people talk, for instance, about techniques like political trusteeship, which would enable a designated human individual or group to speak on behalf of certain parts of nature, a polluted waterway, say, or farm animals, or, or a wild species threatened with development. 
we can imagine this kind of inclusive representation happening at many different levels and in different institutional contexts, from the very local town council or whatever to the transnational. It does pose obvious challenges. I mean, it's hard to know if we're getting things right because of communicative limitations. Um, and it's hard for non-human beings and things uh, to object when we don't get things right. But we don't need perfect knowledge of non-human well-being to make a start. And we can begin where we are. Even imperfect political representation would be a big advance over the status quo, assuming at least that we're committed to expanding our understanding over time and to correcting our mistakes, and assuming that we build a kind of reflexivity into our institutions so that they can be responsive to new information as it arises too. Another way to institutionalize respect for nature is through regimes of animal and earth rights. Um, the German constitution, for instance, includes provisions for animal rights that are intended, it says, to protect the life and well-being of animals as fellow creatures. The constitutions of Ecuador and Bolivia establish even broader protections for what they call the rights of Mother Earth in more generally, and that includes things like uh, nature's right to exist, persist, maintain, and regenerate its vital cycles, and the right to restoration from environmental damage. Like human rights, animal and earth rights are bound to be subject to lots of contestation and many difficulties of enforcement. And as with human rights, we need to be attentive to the ways that their emancipatory potential can be inverted or captured, uh, reproducing domination or generating new kinds of violations. But like human rights, animal and earth rights can be or have the potential to be valuable mechanisms for the limitation of power. Uh, and they have a role to play as one part of a broader critical and contestatory eco-politics. Through things like um, political representation and rights, political respect for nature puts us into political community with non-human beings and things. But it's a new kind of political community. Because in contrast to respect for persons, which entails political equality, though in the difference respecting forms that disability theorists and some feminist theorists and others have pressed for, political respect for nature calls not for political equality, but for political consideration. It asks us to constrain our action with reference to the well-being of non-human beings and things and to incorporate responsiveness to their well-being into our political decision making. But it's not about giving voting rights to cows and rainforests. What it means is that there are principled constraints on what we can do to cows and rainforests, uh, and that their well-being needs to be part of the discussion when we make decisions about public decisions about things like you know, animal agriculture or resource extraction, and that those um, constraints need to be, in, need to be enforced. Um, we do need to practice political respect for nature in ways that are consistent with respect for persons, including respect for human rights and for human well-being more generally. There will be lots of conflicts here, for sure, some of them irreducible. And yet the two forms of respect are also mutually reinforcing in certain ways. For instance, where human rights are strong, things like toxic dumping and resource depletion are a lot harder for corporations and governments to impose on both people and the earth. And because the large-scale economic and political forces that regularly threaten human rights are often the same forces that degrade the earth, constraining the power of these forces through animal and earth rights has the potential to serve people too. Still, respect for nature means making distinctions between important human needs and superfluous human desires. Feeding, clothing, and housing ourselves in sustainable ways are compatible in principle with respect for nature, but unlimited consumerism, profit-driven extractivism, and thoughtless cruelty surely aren't. The distinction between legitimate aims and superfluous desires isn't something that can be specified, I think, once and for all in an abstract sense. It's sensitive to context, and it's properly subject to contestation. The point is that an eco-politics that incorporates respect for nature will put this contestation at the center of public debate and decision making. We'll talk about it. We'll wrestle with it. We won't always agree, but it'll be at the center of our public life, not at the margins or outside the boundaries. So political respect for nature means establishing principled constraints on the human use of power in relation to non-human beings and things. And it means making human power responsive to nature's well-being along with our own. Ethics isn't enough. 
we need to put ourselves into new kinds of political relationship with non-human beings and things, and with one another. Respect for nature is a radical project because of all that it asks us to change, but it's also inescapably a political project, not just because it requires the structural transformation of power, but also because the only way to proceed effectively is together with others, human and non-human. These changes are really demanding. I mean, to make progress on them, we need many different kinds of tools. We need lots of political activism and um, across different issue areas. We need arts and culture, which can be such powerful uh, sources for transforming collective sensibilities. And we need institutional changes in both politics and the economy. We need all these things working in tandem at different levels of engagement, from neighborhoods to bioregions to states um, to transnational organizations. It can feel overwhelming, and I think this is um, one of the biggest challenges we face right now is just how overwhelming it does feel. But we should remember here that large-scale transformations have happened before. Christianity once was new. Capitalism once didn't exist, right? Human rights, representative democracy, the idea of the intrinsic dignity of the person. These things all had to be invented. And I don't mean to sound triumphalist here. I don't think this is a triumphalist story. Not all of those things are good or wholly good. My point is to draw attention to the scale of those transformations. You know, the transformation that we need to today is every bit as deep and wide as those transformations were. But it's also just as possible. Political respect for nature can't possibly solve all our environmental problems, but it's an important part and it's an attainable part of making uh, a better future for all of us who call the earth our home.